Buonasera a tutti, a tutte, buon pomeriggio, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, welcome, benvenuti, benvenute al nostro incontro. Mi chiamo Teresa Fiore, I'm Teresa Fiore, I'm a professor at Montclair State University, sono una docente uh, presso la Montclair State University, e uh, comincio con delle istruzioni tecniche. I'm going to start with the technical instructions. Uh, um, questo è un incontro bilingue. This is a bilingual conversation and we will be using uh, um, interpretation. Questo è un incontro in due lingue e avremo la traduzione simultanea. La maggior parte dell'evento è in inglese, the majority of the event will be in English, con due parti in italiano, with two parts in Italian. Mi rivolgo adesso a chi parla italiano. Scegliete uh, dal menu in basso l'icona del mappamondo che dice interpretazione e scegliete l'inglese per la traduzione simultanea. Ascolterete due voci, uh, la um, mia, uh, in più bassa, e quella più alta di chi uh, traduce. Potete anche togliere la mia cliccando su silenzia audio originale. Cliccate su disattiva se volete sentire solamente la voce del, um, dei relatori direttamente. For those of you who speak English, um, when we have uh, Italian, um, you can uh, use uh, interpretation uh, into, uh, into English by clicking on the icon that says interpretation. Uh, um, uh, click English for the language that you need. You're going to hear two voices, uh, the one of the speaker and then the one of the interpreter on top at a higher volume. If you only want the interpreter, uh, click mute original audio. Um, and if you just want to hear the original voice of the speaker, just click off. I hope I've covered all. Spero di avere uh, illustrato tutto. E, um, grazie per um, esservi uniti a questa avventura bilingue. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us for this bilingual adventure. Hopefully we won't be lost in translation. Uh, speriamo di non perderci in questa traduzione. Bene. Um, continuiamo. Next slide. Next slide again. Um, another uh, piece of technical information, the chat is uh, there for you. If you have a technical issue, we can address it in writing. And uh, the Q&A will take place at the very end of the event, but you can add your questions at any moment during this conversation. We won't be able to have uh, all the uh, questions uh, shared uh, with the group. Uh, we'll do our best, uh, but you can always uh, be in touch with us after the event. So uh, this is uh, uh, an event with many languages because it has a multiple geography. We have uh, uh, speakers located in Italy, uh, in the US obviously, and the UK, and we have a, a pretty global audience of, I'm very pleased to tell you, uh, over 100 people. Um, thanks for being with us. Uh, thanks, of course, first of all, to the panelists, the speakers, um, and thanks to all of you who are joining us from all these countries and probably many more. Uh, this is all made possible by Lydia Rosenberg behind the scenes, uh, who's the magician with Zoom. Uh, but of course, it's made possible by our two interpreters who are gonna go back and forth between English and Italian, Maria Galetta and Lilia Pino Bluen. This event of today, uh, the taste of uh, what we're to in Italy, is uh, part of uh, a series of events that we're able to offer at Montclair State University on a very regular basis, normally once a month. We usually do it in person, but since the pandemic, we've been doing it online which has meant that we've become even more transnational than we used to be. 
Uh, these events are possible thanks to the support of a generous family, the Insera family, in particular, Mr. Larry Insera, who's also on the board of directors uh, on our campus. But this time, we also extend our thanks to the Kali family, and we'll mention them later on. This uh, fund, this endowment was created for uh, the promotion of Italian language, Italian culture, but with a particular twist, that is to say, by looking at how Italian culture travels with its people, with its ideas, with its products, as part of a transnational vision. And it means so that our events, which have been offered, I'm pleased to say, for a decade now, so hopefully we can celebrate actually in, uh, in the fall, who knows if in person, um, they have been also transdisciplinary because knowledge does not belong to any discipline in particular. And another characteristic is that they've always been collaborative. They have entailed many uh, forms of partnership. In particular, this time, these are the different associations and units that we're working with. Of course, we're linked to the Italian program. I'm a faculty member in that program in the Department of World Languages and Cultures. We're collaborating for obvious reasons, given that we're talking about food with the nutrition and food department. We're collaborating with the history department, uh, given uh, that, of course, uh, we are particularly focused on the history of food this time. And that uh, we're partnering up uh, with uh, an association uh, based uh, in Licata in Sicily by the name of Memento. So as you can see, we try to work uh, within the academic world uh, as well as outside of it. Today's topic, I think, exemplifies perfectly well uh, what I just described to you. The taste of World War II in Italy, international tensions and local solutions of the food supplies um, is uh, an opportunity uh, to talk about a topic that brings together indeed history and food, as we were saying. It brings together different methodologies, as we will see from the archives to the oral interviews. And uh, um, it is particularly transnational in the sense that it's, uh, it looks at a conflict, which was international by definition, and it focuses in particular in the second part uh, on the encounter between uh, Sicilians and by extension, of course, Italians and the allied troops, and in particular, uh, the American soldiers. The event is a two-part event. We're gonna have a, a lecture by our uh, distinguished guest speaker, Lizzie Collingham, uh, and uh, um, her lecture will be followed by the presentation of an ongoing project here at Montclair State University, which I have the pleasure of, uh, of coordinating and uh, uh, which I have designed uh, based on a, a, a broader research that I will tell you about in the second part of today's event. Of course, the subject of World War II has been covered by a really vast body of literature, both scholarly and creative, uh, films, uh, novels, uh, memoirs, uh, um, but the lens of uh, food uh, is quite, quite new. And uh, uh, we are quite pleased to have indeed Lizzie Collingham with us because uh, uh, she brings uh, this uh, specific interpretive uh, lens uh, to uh, this world conflict, uh, not as a marginal topic, uh, but really as a central engine to understand uh, how uh, the war worked as you will hear. Uh, in uh, uh, a few minutes. It is also um, a novel uh, take in the sense that, uh, uh, as you will see in the second part, a subject that can be researched with the archives, but also away from them by using literary sources and by using oral history the video interviews which we will share with you uh, in the second part. The third novel um, aspect of uh, uh, today's uh, uh, conversation 
is that of proposing a, a repositioning of the geography of World War II by making a place which is by definition a, a periphery into the focal point. Um, Robert Gordon uh, has written that Sicily is a place where the end of the war begins. And indeed, uh, as we will hear from uh, the next speaker, uh, um, indeed that the beginning of uh, 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 the end of uh, uh, the Axis control of uh, European territories uh, uh, and um, uh, um, in small villages of the, of the southern part of Sicily, uh, as well as on the eastern coast. Today's program then has different voices and I'm going to uh, quickly go over them, mostly so that you know what language they're gonna speak and when you have to click on uh, the icon of the globe in order to get the uh, translation, the simultaneous translation. We're gonna have two sets of introductory remarks in order in English and Italian. The lecture will be in English. Uh, my presentation of the project will be in Italian. And then some comments at the end by Ken Brown will be in English. And the debate will also be in English, but please remember that you can actually write your questions in Italian and I can translate them. To our uh, first speaker then, uh, Jeff Strickland, uh, who is uh, the chair of the history department with which we're collaborating, is a professor of history, author of uh, Unequal Freedoms, Race, Ethnicity, and White Supremacy in Civil War Era Charleston, and a forthcoming book titled All for Liberty, The Charleston Workhouse Slave Rebellion of 1849. He teaches courses on race, the Civil War, and Reconstruction, and today he will provide us with a historical context for the subject that we're addressing. Thank you for being with us, Jeff. Thank you, Teresa. Hello, welcome to Montclair State University and the lecture, The Taste of World War II in Italy, International Tensions and Local Solutions for Food Supplies by Lizzie Collingham. Please let me begin by thanking Teresa Fiore for organizing this wonderful event and for inviting the history department at Montclair State University to co-sponsor it. I also want to thank Lizzie Collingham for sharing her expertise. The topic of food in World War II is undoubtedly a popular one, as evidenced by today's attendance. War is one of the most written about history topics in the United States. Food is an important topic in the history of the American Civil War. Historians emphasize the foraging that armies resorted to when food and other supplies ran low or were non-existent, and the civilian and military deaths from gastrointestinal diseases. Events such as this talk by Lizzie Collingham are critically important to preserving the legacy of the women, men, and children who participated in the global war against fascism particularly the fascist regimes of Benito Mussolini, Francisco Franco, and Adolf Hitler. The recent resurgence of fascism in the United States, and worldwide for that matter, has led many people to recall the heroism of the greatest generation, as Tom Brokaw refers to them, and the sacrifices they made to help win the war. This lecture is also important because it demonstrates the value of the humanities and social sciences in everyday life. There is a great risk in forgetting the past, especially the recent past. It is often said that Americans have short memories. We must continue to educate the general public about World War II, including the Spanish Civil War and the rise of Franco, the six million Jews that were murdered in the Holocaust, and the dangers of totalitarianism in general. On July 10th, 1943, the Allies invaded Sicily in Operation Husky. The single largest assault landing carried out by the Allies during the war as more than 180,000 soldiers went ashore. The fascist government fell quickly and the Allies arrested Mussolini on July 24th. The Allies suffered 23,000 casualties, 
the Germans experienced 30,000 casualties and the Italians 135,000. When Allied forces reached the port city of Messina, they learned that 100,000 German and Italian troops had fled to the Italian mainland. So the Allies turned their attention to the mainland, landing at Salerno and Taranto on September 9th. Heavy fighting occurred at Salerno. On January 22, 1944, the Allies landed at Anzio and headed for Cassino. The battle for Italy lasted 14 months. The Germans finally surrendered on May 2, 1945. The Allied casualties in Italy totaled 313,000, including as many as 70,000 deaths. Importantly, the Allied landing of 156,000 troops at Normandy, France on June 6, 1944, in the D-Day invasion, has received considerably more attention. Through August 21st, 1944, the Allies suffered 226,386 casualties, including 73,000 deaths. It is safe to argue that the Italian campaign deserves far greater attention than it, deserve, than it, than it garners. Robert Argentina, an Italian-American from Pittsburgh, participated in the invasion of Sicily as a member of the so-called Bastard Battalion. He spent three days pinned down on the beach in Sicily. German gunners fired 88 caliber artillery guns on the beach until the US Navy destroyed their positions. Argentina drove a truck and manned a 50 caliber machine gun. Undoubtedly, he witnessed the horrors of World War II, but he also witnessed the incredible generosity of the Italian people who were willing to share what little pasta they had with him and his fellow soldiers. Albert DeFazio, also an Italian American from Pittsburgh, was one of five brothers and spoke fluent Italian. As an 18 year old man, he participated in the battle for Sicily. Later, as he arrived in Naples on the mainland, he could not help but think about how his parents emigrated from the same port only four decades earlier. DeFazio was later wounded while fighting on Monte Cassino. He recalled drinking wine and eating chestnuts and Italian bread while convalescing in a field hospital. I selected the aforementioned interviews from the Italian American Oral History Project at the Senator John Hines History Center. In 2004, the project interviewed 40 World War II veterans who lived in southwestern Pennsylvania. And I want to encourage oral history projects at Montclair State University. The history department started a public history program in September 2020. It is my hope that students and faculty will collaborate on oral histories of New Jersey, including the Italian American experience and the COVID-19 pandemic. Many thanks to all of you for listening and enjoy the program. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff, uh, for providing us uh, with uh, um, some important uh, uh, elements uh, to read uh, um, the historical context, uh, but also thanks uh, for uh, reminding us about the pedagogical nature of, uh, uh, of these moments, um, as well as uh, the moments in which uh, uh, we actually connect with the community, right? With projects that allow researchers and students uh, uh, to connect uh, uh, their activities uh, to uh, to the broader world. Uh, and uh, um, yes, so to more of this, and uh, indeed uh, uh, the project I will talk about is an ongoing one and can certainly embrace uh, more students. Um, our uh, second speaker um, is uh, um, Dr. Maurizio Cellura, uh, who um, um, is actually a professor of uh, building physics at the University of Palermo, um, which he represents uh, at the um, Sustainable Solutions uh, Development Network, uh, which is uh, a UN Environmental Program Agency. Uh, and uh, um, in that capacity, uh, he has been a guest speaker on our campus uh, in 2019. He returns now uh, in a virtual version, but with a wearing a, a very different hat, which is that of one of the founding members of Memento, the association based in Licata, I mentioned before, 
devoted to the preservation of the memory of the 1943 Allied landing in Sicily we just heard about. Maurizio. Um, Thank you, Teresa. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It was a very important moment for me. I also want to thank all of the speakers, all of the other speakers, for this conference, which allows us to uh, go in depth in analyzing uh, transdisciplinary uh, topics that we have discussed many times. Teresa, I also want to thank you for your work in building cultural connections. You work very hard at that, and you really do build bridges and allow us to um, keep the memory alive of what happened in Sicily. And I really want to thank you for multiple collaboration projects that we've started with Memento. And I am confident that they will continue over the next few years. Having said that, I want to explain that Memento was created out of the desire to keep the memory alive in terms of the events that happened on the 10th of July, 1943. It was a day that was a turning point in World War II when the 7th US Army, with its three leading forces, with General um, Listen Ascot landed in the four beaches in Sicily, two at the west and two in the east, invading the town of Licata. Licata was the first beachhead of the US in Sicily, and it was the one where General Patton set up his headquarters. From there, the conquest of Palermo and Messina started. It is where the book, A Bell for Adamo, was set. It is a book by a writer who also won the Pulitzer Prize for it. A lot of the activity that took place in Licata was uh, fundamental for uh, the evolution of World War II. And that day likely marked the beginning of the end of uh, the Nazi fascism era in Europe. The activity of all of the members of Memento, whom I want to thank because of their intense participation, because of all the activities that they carry out, and they're all volunteers, and I want to highlight that. So our aim is really to uh, reclaim, to preserve, to store, to enhance, to study in depth, and to give back the right historical dignity to the town of Licata and the role that it played within World War II. The activity that our association has performed over the past few years is really intense. We have carried out many um, initiatives. We have organized number, a number of exhibitions in 2008, 2011, 2013, 2017. We have organized open-air museum itineraries with some um, commemorative stones for uh, the fallen soldiers of the 207th Coastal Division. And then we located stars in the, uh, sorry, we located stones uh, in the landing sites. And then we organized uh, days dedicated to research and studies, uh, including distinguished scholars such as Teresa Fiore. Uh, and then two of our local historians ha has uh, really contributed to a great extent to the development of the memory of those events. We have performed a um, hard work in terms of uh, reclaiming documents in public and private archives. We have a catalog of what happened at the landing, and we started on that project in 2013. We enhanced uh, air raid shelters, uh, a testimony of the intense tension or intense care that people were taking when trying to find shelter from uh, the bombing. And then many activities of uh, creating networks 
and uh, collaboration with other public and private associations in our land aimed at creating um, a network to preserve memory to go forward for years and years. The dream that we have for Memento is the ability to build a sustainable museum where people will be able to participate firsthand with a transdisciplinary attitude, including the culture of food and history and the culture of that time and local traditions, thinking about the future with a main objective, and that is creating a permanent moment of memory for our land and uh, maintain alive the memory of this event which has changed the history of Sicily and of Europe in its entirety. This is our aim. I, we are hoping to obtain collaboration projects. We're open to network with uh, different entities and Teresa will most definitely be one of the main assets for this collaboration project. To conclude, I want to thank you for the space you gave to our association and I wish you all the best for the rest of the proceedings and I want to thank all of the distinguished speakers who will tell us more about all these experiences. I think that as far as Memento is concerned, this is all I have to say. Thank you again. Grazie Maurizio. Um, thank you uh, Maurizio. And we're going to introduce now uh, our main speaker um, uh, who uh, is a, a historian uh, interested in uh, uh, linking the minutia of uh, daily life, as she put it, um, to the broad sweep of historical processes. Um, she is a, a very prolific author. Uh, I have uh, included here uh, some of uh, her main uh, titles, uh, The Taste of Empire, Curry, uh, the recent uh, uh, Biscuit. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, today uh, we're taking her a little bit back in time to a title that came out uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, but um, obviously, as you can see, there's been a, a fil rouge, a running thread uh, in, uh, in her work in reading history uh, through food. First, uh, as uh, also um, uh, a teacher of, of history at Warwick University, uh, um, a research fellow at Jesus College, uh, Cambridge, and now as uh, an independent uh, writer. It has been a pleasure to be uh, in touch with, uh, with her. And uh, like Maurizio said before, I also hope that this is the beginning of uh, other conversations uh, on a topic that is creating an interesting network of people uh, uh, looking for uh, um, new ways of reading this historical moment. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so without any more ado, I will get on with the, the, my talk. So um, in a secret speech given to a group of young military officers in May 1942, Hitler claimed that Germany had gone to war with the Soviet Union in a battle for food. Food and agriculture are not usually listed as causes of the Second World War. But food and agriculture, or more precisely, the issue of food security was at the heart of many of the policies which set Germany, Italy and Japan on the path to war in the 1930s. Now, I'm only going to talk about the European theatre of conflict for, for the purposes of this paper, but 
um, you can apply many of the arguments I'm going to make about Germany and Italy to Japan. And not, not only did anxieties about securing a national food supply drive these countries to war, food security was also a driving force during the war, pushing the German regime in particular towards ever more radical policies and some of its worst atrocities. Oh, uh, can we go back to my uh, previous slide? Yeah, uh, so food security was an issue due to a fundamental shift in the European diet. And here we've got a picture of a British butcher shop to show you about uh, the, the, an example of all the meat that came in. But at first, in the late 18th century, three quarters of the foods Europeans ate were derived from plants. A century later, the growing urban industrial classes were eating much more meat. In the 1870s, the European per capita consumption of meat was about 16 kilograms. By 1914, it had grown to 50. Now, Britain solved the problem of feeding its population by running down its agricultural sector and outsourcing farming to the rest of the world. In the last quarter of the 19th century, the introduction of railways and steamships meant that transport costs had plummeted. Food could now be grown thousands of miles away from where it was eventually consumed. The food on the British working man's uh, or working family's table linked them in then to the agricultural systems of the rest of the world. The white bread British workers ate was mainly made from wheat imported from North America. Um, the Sunday joint of lamb was normally imported from New Zealand. And uh, he, it, would, it was often defrosted slowly in the shops and then hung out, um, as you can see, rather gorily in this picture. Um, the tea they drank was imported from India and it was sweetened with sugar from Mauritius. In 1939, two thirds of the calories consumed by Britain's population were supplied by imports. Britain's food deficit acted as a pump for commerce. The foreign exchange generated by the export of Britain's manufactured goods financed the import of yet more foodstuffs. Indeed, the British regarded the soft white wheat and loaf that they all ate uh, uh, and favoured so much by its workers as a symbol of the very benefits of free trade. In contrast, in Germany, they were eating rye, dark brown bread. Germany and Italy found themselves in an uncomfortable position in the global food system. The First World War had brought food security to the fore as a political issue of concern. During the war, both the British and Italian governments faced strikes and protests over food shortages, and many European politicians, including Hitler, believed that food shortages and the consequent loss of military and civilian morale had led to Germany's defeat. And the picture there is of a soup. So hungry, this is a pit slide of hungry Germans at a soup kitchen in Berlin in 1918. So stay on that slide. Post-1918, both Italy and Germany were hampered by weak manufacturing sectors that did not earn sufficient foreign exchange to pay for their import requirements. And yet the more their industrial sectors expanded, the more the industrial workers clamored for white bread and meat, foods that required wheat and fodder imports and were a drain on the precious foreign exchange. Italy and Germany wanted to spend their foreign exchange on imports of steel and iron ore in order to build up their industrial and armament sectors. But in the 1920s, foodstuffs and fodder made up half of Germany's total imports. And when Mussolini came to power in 1922, in Italy, wheat imports accounted for more than half the country's trade deficit. If Italy was going to become a great power, dominating the Mediterranean region, it needed to address its balance of payments deficit. To this end, it would have been possible to take the liberal route and scale down the agricultural sector, 
channel the surplus workers into industry and aim for an integration into the world economy. However, the fascist solution was instead to withdraw from a world market which both Germany and Italy regarded as hostile, dominated as it was by Britain and the US. Mussolini argued that in order to achieve maximum political autonomy within the international struggle for hegemony, it was necessary to aim for economic autonomy, or in other words, autarky. And to achieve this, it was necessary to be self-sufficient in food. Reviving the agricultural sector had a special appeal for fascist leaders as they romanticized the rural community as the source of the nation's social health, while they demonized the cities as centers of corruption and decay. In achieving the goal of food autarky, Italy was hampered by the fact that its agricultural sector, although large, was unproductive, and by the fact that many of the 55% of the working population who were employed in agriculture were extremely poor. Nevertheless, in July 1925, Mussolini launched the Battle for Wheat, and so we can have the next slide. This was a programme of land reclam reclamation designed to extend the area planted with wheat, and these are propaganda posters. Um, the pro programme was successful in that within 10 years, wheat production increased by 40%, and Italy was able to significantly reduce its expenditure on food imports. However, Italian civilians did not feel the benefit. The increase in production did not cover the, co the cut in wheat imports. In fact, over those 10 years, the amount of wheat available to the civilian population fell by 14 kilograms per person. And wheat provided half of the Italian population's calories. And of course, 14 kilograms per person is a per capita figure. The real impact would have been felt differently across the population, and it hit low income groups hard. In 1928, the National Research Council set up a food committee for the study of alimentary problems. The committee found a significant nutritional gap between the North and South. Northern Italians ate twice as many eggs and three times more dairy products than Southern Italians. Um, the residents of Milan ate 62 kilograms of meat a year. The residents of Palermo ate only 17 kilograms a year. In addition, while in the north, the nutritional gap between the social classes was small, in the south, it was vast. The committee judged that while Sicily's middle classes were eating adequate amounts of protein and a varied and complete diet, in contrast, the island's agricultural workers rarely ate meat and subsisted on an inadequate diet made up mainly of bread with a little rice or legume uh, soup. Already in 1927, large parts of the population were showing signs of chronic malnutrition. So they may not have been hungry, but their diets were deficient in nutrients. And in the 90s, 30s and 40s, Pellagra reappeared. But the Food Committee ignored its own findings and used the figures it collected to construct a picture of an Italian diet averaged out across the population, which they claimed showed that Italian comps, comp, uh, consumption was finally reaching the minimum international nutritional standards. Meanwhile, as part of the government's discipline of consumption, campaign, Italians were encouraged to eat wholemeal rather than white bread, rice rather than wheat, um, homegrown grapes and citrus fruits rather than bananas or coffee. The battle to reduce imports transformed food preferences into a political statement. The need to secure the food supply played into the aggressive expansionist policies of the fascist regimes by fueling the desire for empires, which, like Britons, would provide the resources to transform them into the great players on the world stage. Mussolini took Italy to war in Ethiopia in 1935, intending to build a new Roman Empire. So can I have the next slide? Um, these are Italian troops uh, going into Ethiopia. Once the region had been conquered, 
Italy sent agricultural experts straight away into Somalia and Eritrea, Ethiopia, to assess how the new colonies could be turned into a breadbasket for Italy. The cultivation of bananas and peanuts was contemplated, and bizarrely, they wanted to grow hibiscus flowers, which would sub made a substitute tea, uh, uh, which the Italians drank instead of coffee. And this was odd, given that Ethiopia was the home of the coffee plant. In 1938, when Marshal Italo Balbo was made governor of Libya, and, and Italy, this was a colony of Italy since 1912, he resettled 20,000 Italian peasants into North Af Africa. They were given specially created farms with the aim that they too would help to rebuild ancient Rome's North African granary. We can have the next picture. Um, these are two soldiers with an Italian settler in Libya. The attempt to create an Italian Mediterranean empire was a disaster. Italy ended up with a growing food death a growing trade deficit and inflation. And unable to establish productive farms, the Italian settlers in Africa actually depended on food supplies sent from Italy. When the National Socialists came to power in Germany in 1933, they too instigated a campaign for nutritional fr freedom. Uh, housewives were urged to buy rye bread rather than white rolls, apples rather than oranges. And in both fascist nations, what would have been considered a miserable and inadequate diet in the 19th century was redefined as patriotic. Mussolini proclaimed that the austere diet of immiseration was in fact a diet that showed Italy's strength and national resistance. Sebastian Hafner complained that Germans today consider hunger almost as a moral duty. He described how anyone who grumbled about the diet of autarky was accused of missing silly and superfluous luxuries, with the result that the many who suffered hunger and deprivation did so in silence rather than be accused of greed. Germany also looked to war to provide it with an empire that would make it self-sufficient. The National Socialist vision of Lebensraum planned to drive the Slavs out of Eastern Europe and replace them with industrious Aryan farmers, tending endless fields of grain, which would make Germany truly self-sufficient, immune to blockade, and strong enough to challenge British and American hegemony. Now, this vision led to two of the National Socialists' most egregious plans as food became a motor powering the escalation of Nazi atrocities. The hunger plan laid out plans to divert Soviet-grown food to the German army, leaving an estimated 30 million Russians to starve to death. And the general plan East calculated that another 70 million Slavs would probably die as they were deported to make way for Aryan farmers. If Mussolini's regime prioritised self-sufficiency above the Italian population's health, Germany prioritised the health of its own civilian population over that of all others. Germany looked on the countries it occupied as a source of plunder, and its attitude towards its Italian ally was similar. As soon as Italy joined the war uh, in uh, 1940, we can have the next slide, Walter Dare, he, he is arriving in Rome, um, the, he, he was the German food and agriculture minister. He went on a tour of the country of Italy to assess the prospects for food exports to Germany. Throughout the war, Italy exported citrus fruits, rice, lentils, vegetables to Germany. During the military campaign in North Africa, the Germans shipped large quantities of Italian fruit and vegetables across the Mediterranean to their troops in, in the desert. Indeed, a substantial proportion of the country's meat supplies were diverted from the plates of Italian civilians onto the plates of the Wehrmacht. A German soldier stationed in Italy was entitled to a daily meat ration of 750 grams, and this would have contained double the amount of calories contained in the normal Italian civilian's daily ration. The German determination to squeeze every morsel of food out of all occupied territories increased over time as Germany realized that this would be a long war of attrition. As the food situation within Germany worsened, they increased pressure on all Western European countries, including Italy, to supply Germany with yet more food. The Italian government complained that the Germans were eating away at Italy. 
and once Germany occupied Italy in 1943, contemptuous towards their erstwhile allies, completely indifferent to the plight of the civilian population, they continued to demand ever more rice, ever more cheese, ever more fruit and vegetables. Now Italy had entered the war with its agricultural sector in a very poor state. The fascist vision of modernity looked backwards to a mythical rural idyll. We can have the next slide. This is lovely Italian peasants in the 19th century. This is the kind of idyll that they look back to. This was an, totally anachronistic in an age when agriculture was moving towards large-scale mechanized, far, mechanized farms. Mussolini was an, a vociferous exponent of ruralization. He argued that this would put Italy on the foundation of a socially stable rural bedrock. Uh, 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 and it would counter the sterility and decadence brought about by industrialization. But while Mussolini's government styled itself as the friend of the small peasant proprietor and landless laborer, in fact, fascist policies, policies benefited the large landowner. Um, the small peasant was often forced to take out a loan while he waited to harvest his crop. This meant that he often took seasonal work to access cash. The large landowners therefore had a large and constant pool of labourers who were able to make some sort of a living from the bit of land they had and were therefore willing to work for less money than they would have been if they'd just been a rural proletariat with no access to land. During the depression of the 1930s, it benefited the government to reduce the urban unemployed and keep the underemployed on the, on the, in the countryside. The irony was that while propaganda encouraged the consumption of homegrown fruit and veg, it was actually unprofitable for farmers to, to grow it, and the amounts declined. The drive for wheat meant that wheat was grown rather than fodder, and this too also led to a per, per capita meat um, consumption dropped by five kilograms a year. The administrative chaos which followed Italian entry into the war in 1940 meant the battle for wheat program was neglected further. By 1943, wheat yields had fallen by 25%. After the German occupation in 1943, wheat yields fell further and they reached about 63% of their pre-war level. Throughout the war, Italy was plagued by the wheat shortfall, which led to constant bread and flour shortages. Even before the war, bakeries had begun adding rice, corn and bran to their bread to eke out the wheat flour. And at the beginning of the war, the leader of the nationalist China, uh, nationalist China, Chiang Kai-shek, had made the mistake of thinking that because China was an agricultural country, it could withstand the strains of war better than the highly industrialized countries. He was wrong, and this was something it Italy discovered too. The Second World War demonstrated that the more modern and capitalized a country's agricultural sector was, the better it was able to adapt to the demands of total war. Countries such as Denmark and Holland, who had modern agricultural sectors, were flexible and could adapt. Governments and occupying powers in China, Southeast Asia, and the whole of Eastern and Western Europe, including Germany and Italy, all discovered that a farming sector based largely on small holdings was unable to withstand the lack of manpower, machinery, and fertilizer, and at the same time increase yields to, to feed a growing army and a huge workforce in, in the industry. Italy's agricultural output fell by 28% between 1939 and 43. And even if the prices to farmers for their products increased, the lack of opportunities to invest any surplus income they, they made in improvements such as mechanization um, meant that there was no incentive for them to increase their yields. In occupied countries in particular, there was no incentive to produce food for an occupying regime. And throughout the world, small farmers retreated into self-sufficiency, which meant they produced less food. And what surplus they did produce, they preferred to channel onto the black market, which paid higher prices. It is far more difficult to exert control over small farmers than it is over large agribusinesses, particularly when the small farmers are disgruntled. Most countries allowed smallholders to hold back a certain amount of their produce to, to feed themselves. And it was extremely difficult to police the quantities a smallholder held back. For example, in France, um, 
the mother of a, a friend of mine in France, uh, her, her father was a, a, a farmer and he would take his wheat allowance to the mill, carrying all the correct paperwork in case he was stopped by a German patrol. If his horse and cart were lucky enough not to be stopped on that journey, he would make a second trip and illegally double his personal allowance. Already in 1936, the Italian government issued complementary compulsory delivery orders compelling farmers to deliver 95% of their wheat crop. But southern farmers in particular ignored this. Black market activity is a very good indicator of how well a country's rationing system worked and the extent to which the civilian population accepted it. Italy's failing system is shown by the fact that once they joined the war, the black market grew. And in 1947, only 47% of the wheat harvest had been delivered to the government. And although the compulsory delivery scheme was extended to meat and oil, it was ineffective. It became increasingly difficult for the government to issue the food ration. And Italy's ration was amongst the lowest in Europe. In June 1942, the average daily ration provided an inadequate 950 calories. The urban population without access to land suffered the most, especially as the people complained that the daily 150 grams of ration bread functioned more as a laxative than sustenance. The bakers used chickpea and corn flour in the ration bread and held back the good flour to, to make into good bread to sell on the black market. Black market bread costs 40 lira a kilo, pasta 60 lira, oil as much as 300 lira a litre, but a factory worker only earned about 200 lira a week. When in 1944, the agricultural minister Eduardo Moroni begged Germany to send a delivery of grain or at least some trucks so the food could be transported to the city, his pleas fell on deaf ears. And all over Europe, people from the cities would travel out into the countryside and barter their household goods for food. And in Germany, this was called hamster. So like hamsters, people would uh, who stuff their cheeks with food as they and then carry it back to their holes. People would go out into the countryside, swap their Persian rugs and carry the food back to their homes. By 1943, a contemporary study calculated that families were spending roughly 40% of their food budget on black market products. So we can have the next slide. Uh, that's a black market deal in Rome. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of food going down in the black market. By 1945, Italians were making 70% of their food purchases on the black market. Allied ration foods were now available. Um, but a can of condensed milk cost 120 lira. Chocolate, a kilo of chocolate, cost 1,000 lira. And in Rome, teachers, state employees, and pensioners were dependent on soup kitchens. Well, now, already in the 19th century, America had a, had a reputation as a land of plenty. The Polish term to emigrate was uh, to bread, um, literally. I can't pronounce the Polish term. Europeans spoke of emigrating to America to put food on the table. And emigrants reinforced this image because they wrote letters back saying they could have meat three times a day. Uh, they could eat as much suet and sugar as they would have in, in a fortnight as they would have done at home in six months. And the Second World War only served to reinforce this image. And I'm coming to an end now. During the Second World War, the United States was the only country in the world to experience an agricultural as well as an industrial boom. The problems American fa farmers faced were minimal compared to those faced by farmers in the other combatant nations. There was no danger of an enemy capturing agricultural land. The US had enough resources to produce farm machinery and fertilizers, as well as tanks and munitions. Indeed, and we can have the next slide now, the American agricultural sector modernized and expanded, doubling the amount of machinery and tractors on its farms during the war. After a decade of overproduction during the Depression, they now had a huge market for their food. Indeed, the Second World War became known as the Good War because it lifted Americans out of unemployment and people were able to spend their increased wages on more meat, more dairy. In fact, the consumption of meat among the working classes in America increased by 17%, as well as um, lots of 
cheese and fruit and veg. Kids started eating spinach. Indeed, American expenditure on food increased by 8%. On top of this, America was able with ease to feed its own 11 million servicemen, as well as supply food to China, Russia and Britain through the Lend-Lease scheme. Rationing was eventually introduced in America. Most of the good cuts of red meat disappeared into the army barracks, leaving civilians with less good cuts. But still, um, uh, apart from coffee shortages and a few sugar restrictions, rationing had little impact on either the structure nor the size of American meals. Americans, however, had the least emotional investment in the war of all the combatant nations. And one of George Marshall's strategies for dealing with an army of drafted men who preserved a strong civilian mentality and felt that their country owed them a great deal for fighting for them was to provide them with generous meals. American soldiers were plied with meat, milk and vegetables to the extent that a great many of them gained weight during training. The Surgeon General's office went to great lengths to design balanced mess and field rations. And we can have the next slide. Um, this is American troops eating um, the, the, some of their rations from a cat. I think it's a, probably a sea ration. Um, and the US Army was unusual in that it accorded food virtually equal weight with the rest of the equipment shipped overseas for its troops. A study of U.S. quartermaster operations concluded at the end of the war that food was the best be, had been the best handled category of supplies and a food shortage in any U.S. military unit, no matter how small, had been regarded as a major emergency. Indeed, a subsistence philosophy had emerged which saw it as a U.S. service technician's duty to provide men with hot, new, tasty, nutritious meals under every circumstances. And wherever they went, the Americans had more food than anyone else. How these doughboys do feed, commented one envious British soldier as he watched the GIs feast on porridge and cream and peaches, uh, white bread and jam, pancakes and syrups, bacon and pucker coffee. As the North African campaign drew to an end and the Allies prepared to invade Sicily, the US Subsistence Research Laboratory issued the men with a new ration pack known as the five in one. And this contained tins of roast meat, roast beef, meatballs and spaghetti, canned bacon, dehydrated potatoes, vegetable soup, dried milk, cabbage flakes, which I have to say the troops usually threw away, and a tomato juice cocktail. And these were the ration packs the Americans brought in to hungry Italy, where the basic ration by that point provided a measly 665 calories. As one Italian worker commented, not enough to live on and not enough to die on. Infant mortality had risen to 438 per thousand live births. Now today, the, the country with the worst mortality rate is Afghanistan, and that's 104 to the 438 of the Italy in the Second World War. Malnutrition and tuberculosis had reached epidemic proportions among Italian children. And even though UNRWA, the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Administration was bringing in food to help alleviate the situation, half of it was disappearing onto the black market. Wherever the, Mer the Americans fought, they left behind them a trail of discarded ration containers. They got bored with their rations and threw them away uneaten. And indeed, this was a prob such a problem because econ enemy reconnaissance planes would look out for the glint of metal as they flew over and uh, find their bivouacs and dug dug dugouts. So they, in the end, the, the Americans had to paint Russian ca ration cans green so they wouldn't glint. But as the Americans moved through the country, Italian civilians would venture out to spot where the Americans had been dug in and to look for the rejected rations. Um, next slide, please. That's uh, the Americans entering Palermo. So the war acted as a powerful vehicle for spreading the American way of eating across the globe. Cucini Volanti, I'm sure that's very badly pronounced, or flying kitchens sprung up all over Italy. The GIs would bring the food supplies to a woman's home and she would prepare them a home cooked meal. And the family, of course, got the leftovers. 
fascist propaganda may once have dismissed American cuisine as nothing more than meals thrown together from a collection of canned goods, but now Italians acquired a taste for tinned foodstuffs, even though everything tasted, even the spaghetti, strangely of sugar. The economic resources of the US, which had been so powerfully demonstrated by the firepower at the disposal of their soldiers, was now made manifest to the defeated Europeans by their bountiful supplies of food. In shabby, war-torn Europe, US bases stood out as islands of affluence. The impressive physique of the GIs contrasted with the grubby, malnourished bodies of the Europeans, um, and indeed the thousands and thousands of care packages which were sent to Italian and other European civilians acted as a kind of um, display of American wealth that was given in charity to, to, the, to the poor and hungry Europeans. In 1945, the United States War Food Administration recognized that food was an essential weapon of war, ranking alongside ships, airplanes, tanks and guns. Food, particularly American food, the official statement continued, has been especially crucial in the present war, essential to the fighting efficiency of our allies, as well as our own military forces, and required to maintain colossal industrial productivity here and in other allied countries. And the US now was quick to see that in the post-war world, the ability to command plentiful quantities of food continued to equate with power. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Uh, this in person would have been a big applause uh, for um, carrying us through a particularly complex period. Uh, fascism and Nazism on the one side, uh, the war starting a, a very complex uh, geography uh, that goes well beyond uh, Europe. Um, I particularly um, appreciated uh, your look at the colonies as well, and uh, how the imperial project uh, was uh, an intrinsic part uh, of uh, the, uh, the conflict. Um, but I also appreciated in particular your constant reference to class and how decisions on the part of uh, governments uh, or even specific military strategies uh, um, had different effects depending on the type of population, on the sector of the population that they reached. That does not mean that the war or the late fascism in Italy, uh, of course, uh, uh, hungered people to a certain degree, uh, but it did so in different ways. And I say this because uh, this is definitely something that has come up uh, in talking to people, and uh, I'm really eager then uh, to hear what you have to think after listening uh, to the voices uh, of uh, the interviewees of the project. So we're now going to uh, move uh, to uh, uh, the second part. So the project, il, il the project the, uh, is based on um, a wider study on Italian migration abroad, and in particular in the United States and on colonialism and immigration in Italy today, which are phenomena that I connect um, in a, a cross-border way so that I can um, bring forward a new interpretation of Italy as a place of mobility. This project uh, materialized in a project of 2017 by the title uh, Preoccupied Spaces, and I'm happy to report that it will be published by Lemonie Mondadori in Italy, in Italian, before the summer. Why do I mention this? Because the studies on Italian migration in the United States include also a chapter on the role of the Italian-American descendants in World War II. It was a military strategic role that was uh, promoted by the US government because 
there were enemy troops that arrived in a fascist country and they wanted for them to be seen as friends and relatives. And they were relatives. The connection was strong between Sicily and the United States and Italy by extension as a result of that long and complex Italian emigration in the United States. The second matrix of the project is literary by nature. The reading of a short story by Leonardo Sciascia by the title uh, The American Aunt, which uh, focuses on the issue of the American landing in Sicily. And this allowed me to analyze this through my disciplinary approach, which is cultural. I am not an historian by training, but I do uh, refer on a regular basis to the work of historians. In the case of this short story, and this is the added value provided by interdisciplinary studies, we do find a, a text written by the distinguished Italian writer Leonardo Sciascia. He very cleverly tells us about war and emigration, and he does that by talking about food practices, food as uh, exchange, food as value, food as symbol, food as something that people lack and that people want. The tale is told by the point of view of a young Sicilian, a Sicilian kid, most likely Leonardo Sciascia himself, and it revolves around the microcosm of a family within which there are diverging political opinions. Um, some are pro-fascist and some are anti-fascist and some are indifferent. Looking at this um, nuclear family, Leonardo Sciascia is actually talking about Sicily and about Italy as a whole. Um, talking about the United States using an Italian expression, which is l'America, including the article in the name, Americans are seen as a military enemy, but also as a liberator, and also as um, a relative it's almost an appendix of Sicily. It's as if it was a piece of Sicily located elsewhere. And of course, it is the land of plenty, according to that myth, which was always such a magnet for emigration and which um, people who emigrated themselves have um, enhanced and nourished over time. An example that is taken directly um, from the story is a passage in which the small narrator speaks. I too was waiting for the Americans, he says, when um, he is there, or they are all there waiting for the troops. My mother told me about America, that she had a sister there who was rich and had a large store and four children and one already grown up, a son who might be one of the soldiers who were uh, waiting for. And for me, America was my aunt's large store, a shop as large as Piazza del Castello, full of good things like clothes, coffee, and cuts of meat. And my aunt's son was a soldier who was bringing those good things with him. And he was good at fighting, of course. And you can see that in Italian, there are some words that were highlighted in red. And they are actually calques of, uh, it, of, of English words kept as such in Italian. For example, the word fight, uh, spelled F-A-I-T, the way it would sound or and then would be written by an Italian. So reading this story uh, prompted a lot of questions within me. 
Mr. Shasha tells us what the Sicilians were eating and what they were not eating. And I wondered, was it truly like that? Or was Shasha's imagination involved in it? Or indeed, he um, documented himself by talking to people. So what were Sicilian eating and what were they not eating in the later stage of fascism and during the war? And what did Americans bring? The second part of the story is devoted to the post-war period. And it is about the visit by the famous American aunt who shows up with all of her generosity, quote unquote, and also her arrogance. And Shasha is always using his very subtle irony. The other question is, the availability of food, was it truly limited for everyone? Or this uh, hungry Sicily was a way for the Americans to um, corroborate their propaganda and presenting themselves as those who uh, removed the hunger of a population that was uh, in its knees. Or maybe was Sicily perceiving itself as being hungrier than it actually was when it compared itself to the land of plenty when with the milks of uh, with the rivers of milk and honey, which was the classic image of this uh, faraway land. Next slide. So our project, which started around these questions, was a way to meeting um, about 20 people between Agrigento and Palermo, including um, their provinces in Lecata, and Valedolmo, and also Gela in the Caltanissetta province, which is another place where the Allied troops arrived uh, after landing on the 10th of July. Next. We are talking about men and women with first-hand recollection of the landing. They were physically there. Uh, they were there at very different ages. Some of them were really small, really young. So maybe they were too young for those memories to actually be firsthand. And the exception was two voices, which was Dr. Zangara and Chef Pino Huktaya for um, their historical interest uh, and for Pino Kutaya for in the gastronomy field and their historical point of view. The um, long-term objective is a website with video, text and images, which you will find at the link um, posted above, tinyurl.com slash foodww2. You can click on the red button where you uh, will be able to see the video interviews. Now, I would like to give the floor to the people we interviewed. I have a number of very short video clips that I have organized uh, thematically. I will start off with a contrast, just like many of the contrasts we observed between, on the one hand, the documentation of the recollection of hunger, the terrible hunger which um, leads people to dream about food, and I'm thinking about some pages by Primo Levi, and on the other hand, a, con a condition of well-being. And the reason, of course, the social class that people belong to, especially at a time in which food was um, rationed or only available in the black market. So I leave you here with the first selection of videos. So Lydia, you can start.
uh, potete uh, cliccare sul uh, bottone rosso che dice video interviews per vedere le video interviste. Next slide. Adesso vorrei lasciar parlare uh, le persone che abbiamo intervistato. Si tratta di clip molto brevi che ho organizzato tematicamente. Parto con uh, un contrasto, come tanti dei contrasti che abbiamo riscontrato, tra da un lato uh, la documentazione, il ricordo della fame, addirittura la fame terribile che lascia immaginare il, uh, il cibo, uh, vengono in mente pagine di Primo Levi e dall'altro invece una condizione di benessere, tutto questo per ragioni legate ovviamente all'estrazione sociale, persino in un momento in cui il cibo era razionato o era disponibile solo nel mercato nero. Vi lascio quindi con una prima selezione di video. We can start Lydia with uh, a few videos. Quando mi ricordo quando io giocavo, non so, 5, 6 anni, 7 anni giocavo con i bambini, mamma fammi ciò, vieni mamma, vieni. E mi dava un pezzetto di pane qua e un pezzetto di pane qua. E mi diceva questo è formaggio e questo è pane, per scherzare però. E io ci credevo e facevo quello di pane e quello di formaggio. Il pane c'era, il pane nostro era buono, sempre buono è stato. No, e poi mio, mio padre, con la cosa, la cosa che aveva lui, non ci faceva mai mancare niente, di qualsiasi cosa di qualsiasi tipo. Nella mia famiglia è abbastanza bene, perché quando ci sono i soldi c'è tutto. <ride> e quindi, eh, insomma, fame... Non ce n'era a casa mia. Mio papà eh, aveva certamente amici, eh, non mancava la farina, non mancava pasta, il pane si faceva in casa e quindi eh, però c'erano persone che mangiavano quello che passava, eh, il pane nero, la pasta nera, ma brutta. In campagna eh, avevamo le galline, la pecorella, la, pecorella, la capretta che ci dava il latte. <ride> Poi quando ci sono i soldi amicizia non, non, non manca niente. Eh, il fratello di mio papà aveva il tabacchino e, e quindi eh, nemmeno per fumarsi <ride> eh, avevamo diciamo, difficoltà. Le condizioni di vita delle nostre popolazioni erano condizioni di vita molto elementari. Durante la guerra c'erano i disagi, le racconto un piccolo episodio. E anni 30 e primi anni 40. A San Cataldo c'era una salumeria, che non era salumeria perché vendeva solo salde salate. Il proprietario di questa salumeria la sera si metteva, il pomeriggio si metteva davanti a questa bottega con un barriere dove erano sistemate queste salde salate. E allora bagnava sarde all'acqua di colonia, io me lo ricordo ancora, ce l'ho ancora nelle orecchie, sarde all'acqua di colonia, 21 sarde una lira. Quindi un capo di famiglia che aveva 7-8 figli, passava là, comprava con una lira, comprava 21 sarde, e 21 sarde era la cena per tutta la famiglia. La differenza di classe c'era, perché c'erano i cosiddetti burgesi, borghesi, no? che avevano un pezzo di terra. Il resto della popolazione, la carne, la mangiava solo per Natale e per Pasqua. La casa mia, che avevamo, diciamo, essendo mio padre appuntato dei carabinieri, avevamo uno stipendio fisso, eccetera, la carne si mangiava due volte alla settimana, si mangiava il giovedì e la domenica. I 200 grammi di pane che veniva distribuito non era pane fatto di grano, ma era pane fatto con gran turco, giallo, quindi la farina, o addirittura di segala, pane nero a cui noi non eravamo abituati, a parte il fatto, ripeto, che era insufficiente la razione. La cosa eh, più intelligente, ecco, tra virgolette, che fece gli americani, fece arrivare delle navi, le famose Liberty, cariche, cariche di farina bianca. La popolazione eh, considerò lo sbarco, 
non tanto come una liberazione, perché noi parliamo di guerra e liberazione, la considerava come la fine della guerra. Non era la pace, era la fine della guerra. Questo è il punto. Soprattutto la fine dei disagi, sia provocati dai bombardamenti, e sia provocati anche dal razionamento, perché ripeto, quello che veniva distribuito tra pane, pasta, olio, zucchero, farina, eccetera, eccetera, era assolutamente insufficiente. Le condizioni di vita... Next, uh, uh, nostro... uh, so, as you, so, come potete vedere da questi... As you can see breve, from uh, breve these breve short clip, clips, abbiamo we have molto very diverse, different experiences based sociale, on the social class e, that people um, belong to. Eh, ma la And the question here is... Anche to what extent was memory certo accurate or not after so much time has gone by and to what extent is the story uh, uh, che the fruit of the imagination. La diversità dell'esperienza But in base what is impressive sociale. is how different the experience was Il, uh, depending on the social class. The second group della, of video clips I want to uh, share uh, is the one about the arrival of the troops, militare, which is a military arrival officially, but it becomes a As uh, il professor, professor uh, Allotta uh, stated, un is also è uno the landing decidi. of food. It's Next, the landing the of food video supplies. Qual è stata la mia uh, meraviglia quando ho visto quel mare tutto nero, che, tutti questi zatteroni che uscivano, camminavano in mezzo all'acqua e uscivano sulla terraferma e ci ne chiamavano di qua di qua di che cosa mamma mia meraviglia questa è la prima meraviglia che è stata eh, ricordo che dicevano che quando arrivavano le navi addirittura si legavano le calze cioè le, 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 i pantaloni per far sì che diventava uno sacco e, e mettevano, e per cui persone che magari quasi non riuscivano a camminare, talmente tanta roba avevano addosso, no? perché diventava proprio lo sbarco, non era solo uno sbarco americano, ma era anche uno sbarco di cibi. Questo arrivo dei cibi, this uh, arrival che, of food, eh, which generates wonder, l'arrivo di tutte le Just like the arrival le navi of all the che sono state boats that were described at the beginning of this uh, webinar leads to very different reactions. Uh, sono dei cibi da this un lato food is on the one hand welcomed and therefore embraced, sono anche but on the other hand uh, there is an element of fear and therefore rifiutati. rejection. E and rejection is connected to political reasons, it is connected to um, hearsay uh, and also to the social class once sociale. again. Lydia, we can watch the next set. L'arrivo degli americani vede, è stata una cosa straordinaria, la prima cosa principale appena sono sbarcati è arrivata l'abbondanza. Caramelle e cioccolati così a buttarle dai, dai, dai camion. E come se le accettava? Guardi, io le dico questo. Il giorno seguente allo sbarco, proprio la mattina, mi hanno offerto una tavoletta di cioccolata. Lei mi crede? Per orgoglio gliel'ho rifiutata. Non è perché mi sentivo allora un fascista. Fin dalla nascita avevamo quella e quella era l'indirizzo, la linea da seguire da quella. Poi sbarcati gli americani abbiamo gustato la libertà. Piano piano abbiamo gustato realmente che cos'è ciò che hanno dato gli americani, ci, ci si sono avvicinati a noi, ci facevano salire sulle macchine, tante cose ecco, ci offrivano sigarette, scatolette, guardi, latte condensato, latte in polvere, uova in polvere, tante cose, sigarette dentro, dentro le scatolette, cesta a pelle, oh, look, sai, Philip Morris, Camel, tutte queste sono passate anche dalle mie perché le ho fumate.
<ride> io gli parlavo in italiano, loro parlavano magari in, in gialese. Perché i figli di siciliano che parla, sapevano parlare soltanto in siciliano. E sempre vino volevano, ecco. Drink, drink wine, drink wine. Loro, il, da mangiare ci offrivano loro. Noi gli portavamo il vino, ecco. Ma era buonissimo. Era buonissimo. Era una bella carne buonissima. Mette, eh, me, eh, c'era scritto mette con fagioli, mette con Era cioè, la carne con qualche cosa, con quello che c'era. Anche fino a dopo la guerra, ancora c'è stata fame, perché sì, era quello, non c'era niente. Guarda il pane, quello della cassetta, eh, quello se, ci sembrava a noi panettone. <ride> perché abituati anche a mangiare il pane di grano, di grano turco, con le tessere, e diventava duro, giallo. L'arrivo degli americani vede, è Buona stata una cosa... Lidia. Così, io sinceramente non le ho assaggiate completamente, <ride> ho visto che giustamente le davano ai bambini, c'era una gente povera e ci davano le scatolette, anche nelle scatolette c'era la pasta, c'era la pasta nelle scatolette, non solo carne, c'erano tante cose che veramente mi raccontavano che erano molto gustose, forse era la povertà che le sembravano gustose, ma erano buone. Non le mangiava perché mangiava a casa. <ride> C'è un principio nella vita, non lo so. Non sono abituato io così. Forse perché mio padre era sarto, era una persona che se la passava bene, perché di origine ce l'abbiamo passato sempre bene. E allora mangiare queste cose, sì, scatolette le mangio io, le vado a comprare, no? Ma delle gli americani, non lo so, per me era un'offesa. No alla qualità, non ne... per me non andavano queste cose. Forse le caramelle le ho prese, i cioccolatini le ho prese, ma prendere la scatoletta per me era, per me era un'offesa. Per noi era una novità, eh, scatolare eh, i fagioli con la carne e poi a scuola davano il formaggio che era quasi arancione diciamo, davano tante cose, il pane, il pane bianco ma bianco che era meraviglioso. In Sicilia non c'erano queste, queste cose che distribuivano gli americani e quindi erano ben accettate. All'inizio c'era un pochino di paura per, perché non conoscendo le persone certamente si dubitava, ma poi altro che accettavano <ride> con la fame che c'era, <ride> una paura che... Cibi variati, magari eh, non conoscendole, magari eh, facevano schifo, <ride> invece no, poi se erano piacevole. Chi sapeva che cosa fossero se ciungano? <ride> Quell'ufficiale che si era fermato da, da noi perché aveva visto che c'era una bambina, <ride> E, um, mi voleva dare delle chungan, chungan che noi non conoscevamo, alle carte non si vedevano queste cose ancora, e allora me le offriva, allora il papà dice no, non mangiare, mi fece segnale, dice no, non mangiare, non mangiare, e allora lui, mezzo italiano e mezzo inglese, mi diceva good, 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 solo che mi fece con il dito così e poi pu, pu. Dopo, dopo di aver tolto tutto il sapore della ciunga, si poteva gettare, ma lui diceva pu, pu, non era caramella. <ride>
Uh, as you saw, the language issue comes back. The idea is that it is foreign soldiers, but they do communicate with the local population. We are ready for the last video clip, which is about what Lizzie Collingham discussed, and that is what happens after the war when these products continue to arrive and they arrive with packages from America. Things change in a final way, and the relationship between people and their diet um, is revolutionized. E quindi poi a poco a poco i prodotti americani che costavano poco, ripeto, entrarono nell'uso corrente. Per esempio, con i pacchi dell'America arrivava il caffè che noi non avevamo questo benedetto caffè così buono, così adesso facciamo il caffè, ma il caffè buono arrivava dall'America, arrivavano questi, oppure i biscotti nelle scatole, nelle scatole di latta, che noi non avevamo le scatole di latta, e ci piacevano queste scatole di latta con questi fiori, questi, queste decorazioni nelle scatole di latta, che poi usavamo come, come trofei queste scatole svuotate del contenuto, oppure le zollette di zucchero per esempio, perché non, non era facile queste zollette di zucchero, perché se arrivavano i pacchi dall'America ci mandavano lo zucchero non in polvere, ma a zollette, e queste zollette erano una cosa straordinaria per noi bambini. Ripeto, il caffè e lo zucchero erano i prodotti più graditi rispetto ad altri prodotti, ripeto. Thank you, Lydia. This leads me to the conclusion of this webinar. Therefore, I invite you to write in the chat or in the Q&A uh, your questions. I'm going to switch back to, uh, uh, to English now. Uh, and now um, uh, I will give the floor to uh, uh, Ken Brown uh, very briefly. Uh, uh, one of the two students involved in this project, along with Francesca Oliveri, who has helped with the transcriptions. Uh, Ken comes to us with uh, uh, a long experience as a student, also in prestigious programs and with long experience as a video maker uh, and uh, a lover of uh, Italian language and uh, uh, Italian uh, culture. And he wants to say a couple of words in closing uh, uh, about his experience in the project. Uh, grazie, uh, Dr. Fiore. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you uh, so much for this opportunity to be part of this project. Uh, my story is uh, very simple. Uh, my Italian, uh, which was once proficient, was uh, becoming molto arrugginito. And uh, I learned about the Italian department at Montclair State. And uh, I enrolled in a class under a wonderful program called Older Adult Learner. And, uh, you know, that over the past uh, two, three years, that has brought me to this wonderful opportunity to participate with you today. Uh, I have to acknowledge the wonderful faculty and professors in the Italian department at Montclair State uh, who helped me so much with my Italian, uh, Professors Anteno, Stel Principe, Miele, and uh, Professor Trubiano, who actually offered a course in translating and subtitling uh, that enabled me to produce uh, with uh, Dr. Fiore the clips that you've just seen. I think for me as an Italian student, uh, I was reminded, and uh, I think this is true of a student of any language, that face-to-face -face communication and use of the language is better than any software, any app, Duolingo, uh, you name it. Uh, you have to go to where the uh, language is being used, lived, breathed, and get into it. Unfortunately, it, right now it's very hard to do, but I'm very, very, very grateful that uh, this project took place in 2019. And I have to say uh, how wonderful it was and humbling. It was a privilege to be welcomed into the homes of these questi uh, vecchietti siciliani, anziani siciliani. Uh, they were in their 80s, they were 90s. We interviewed a gentleman who was 100 years old. These were children uh, uh, when Los Barco Aliato took place and uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, we, we were in the home of Carmela Zangara and Arturo Cambiano 
and their home was actually right over the beach, the very beach where the first troops, uh, U.S. troops came ashore on July 10th and 1943. And I, I would like to just say one thing uh, in meeting this uh, amazing couple uh, that uh, Carmela Zangara actually was a teacher and uh, she discovered to her amazement that her students had no knowledge that uh, Los Barco, the landing had taken place in their town. And she uh, set herself to uh, capture these stories, record them, and they became a wonderful book called uh, Dieci Lulio 1943. And uh, I hope I'm not speaking too fast for the interpreters, uh, but uh, I, I, I would like to uh, pass along a message that Carmela said to us uh, when we were there, what motivated her to do this work. Il passato sia di monito per il futuro. Let the past be a warning for the future. And uh, again, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, opportunity. And to all my classmates who are here, if you're studying Italian, I love you. And uh, go to Italy and use it. Ciao. Thank you, Ken, uh, for, your, for your perspective. And uh, we um, are running a little bit late. Uh, we're 10 minutes uh, over the time. Uh, but I do want, uh, if it's okay for the panelists uh, about Lizzie, uh, to at least embrace uh, a couple of questions. Uh, um, one that struck me actually had to do with, uh, uh, with beer. Uh, uh, we've heard a little bit about uh, uh, wine and certainly wine is uh, quite represented in photographs uh, of uh, uh, that period of uh, uh, the arrival of, uh, of the troops. So I was wondering after talking about so much food, if you can tell us a little bit about drinks during the war, even if briefly. I don't know anything, uh, beer doesn't, beer has never really come up in, in anything I've read about for Italy or France, it's always um, wine. So I I noticed I loved the videos that, and th what was very interesting to me about watching those videos is that they said things which I've seen people or read people saying in Italy, in Japan, in Germany, you know, so that they, they completely corroborated everything I expected, but they said it so beautifully and it was so lovely. So yes, wine, and in France in particular, the, the soldiers would always ask for wine and they would give out cigarettes or, or so. So beer, I don't know. I don't know anything at all about beer, so I can't say anything sensible, but wine was definitely high on the agenda for the soldiers. Yes, and uh, it doesn't look like it was uh, it was lacking <laughs> locally, <laughs> so it, it became a sort of a, a local currency. Yeah, that right? was something that the Sicilians actually had. Yes. Uh, yeah. So you know they could really exchange that for other goods. Uh, another interesting question that we got from uh, um, Diana Gervin is actually about possible forms of fusion that were born from the encounter uh, with, uh, uh, with the allies. Uh, um, of course, uh, I'm thinking of Carbonara, uh, which is uh, uh, always associated uh, you know, with this period where bacon and eggs uh, end up in being uh, part of uh, uh, a signature pasta that now we consider quintessentially uh, Italian. And uh, um, I don't know if you have uh, other stories. Uh, uh, Diana was even thinking about what has happened in the colonies as well uh, around uh, this period. Um, and uh, uh, thank you for mentioning uh, the hibiscus leaves, uh, il carcade, uh, uh, which uh, remained actually uh, in uh, the, the normal diet of, of Italians for quite a long time. I remember that as a, as a child myself. But that's interesting. You don't you don't drink hibiscus tea anymore, I assume. I wouldn't say it's that common, but okay. the, the word carcade was also quite exotic at that time. Yeah, because I just thought it was so absurd because after all, in Ethiopia, that is the home of coffee. So it seemed absurd to be trying to grow an ersatz coffee substitute in Ethiopia. But um, uh, what was the other question about fusion foods? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think... 
um, I, I don't, I don't, I can't name for you, you know, your, your, your video, the people you interviewed would be much better able to um, answer that question in a way. But I mean, my impression is that like these flying kitchens, so that these people mm. would, would they, the, the, the soldiers would bring in the, the tins or whatever they could get hold of. And then the the women obviously it was normally women um in the households would have to kind of make something out of this and it was all very unfamiliar and peculiar food i mean uh, people constantly comment and i noticed in the american aunt story as well he also comments on that how everything tasted of sugar even the canned spaghetti tastes sweet and sugary and it's weird and it's very american because to, to put sugar in everything so i think uh, you got some very peculiar um you know, people cobbled together a, an approximation of what they thought was a meal with whatever they could get. So I think you did get some very odd dishes I indeed, but nobody really cared because it was food. And they were, I mean, there were plenty of people who, who didn't notice the war and, and, and had access to goats and milk and so on, but there were an equally large number of people for whom you know, who were willing to, uh, there's a shocking description in Naples of how uh, one GI noticed people were actually digging, they had some kind of implement and they were digging the garbage out of cracks in the dock, in the step between the stones in the docks, because they were looking for something edible, even in the kind of gunk that had been spilt on the docks. So people were that hungry. So, um, you know, some cobbled together weird carbonara would be fine but I can't I can't tell you a particular dish that comes out mm. of this I, I'm interested mm. that carbonara appears to have come out of it <laughs> the, um, certainly what you describe about the desperation is something that is uh, linked to Naples the situation in Naples uh, was uh, uh, very very desperate it was particularly bad there and uh, um, but I, I that uh, what I have been able to gather so far uh, does not give that type of uh, extreme uh, condition and uh, also in the urban areas such as in Palermo where that may have happened to a degree um, many people had a second home in the yeah. countryside and there was a big exodus uh, uh, so they could have uh, access uh, to actually yeah. pretty uh, healthy food yeah. right exactly. from, uh, from the countryside and so um, of course uh, uh, my project uh, underlines uh, uh, hunger but as you can see uh, one of the goals is to somehow uh, uh, challenge the myth of the liberator uh, that feeds uh, oh, hungry. You should definitely Absolutely. challenge that myth because after all i mean it the point is it was even if it wasn't true it was the perception and right. that that was the perception uh, that, right. that created it and also a lot of the food that unra were you know the un relief and rehabilitation administration were were uh, 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 giving out after the war straight up uh, this is after the americans have kind of moved up and and um uh, sort of left Sicily and moved up into Germany is you remember this is Britain Britain has to ration bread and potatoes for the first time which they had never rationed during the war because they have to ship their wheat to occupied Europe and, and liberated Europe because the Americans renege on their deals and feed their wheat to pigs and chickens in America so that Americans can have good meat again okay yeah. so the americans are not these what you know yes we should not think these americans were wonderful saviors who were you know sacrificing everything or giving that their largesse away no and they like to promote that and they definitely were that in comparison to those poor people but they weren't necessarily um heroes and good guys in the way that they were giving the largesse there you know they were willing to sacrifice anything for themselves right and also the the system was not as efficient for example in terms of provision of uh, of wheat uh, uh, so um, you uh, you're right and this uh, uh, comes to the surface so like other stories that we could not include here some of them quite uh, tragic and violent about their arrival are not necessarily related to food, but 
certainly the idea is not to represent uh, this uh, moment uh, as only uh, a peaceful encounter. It was not yeah. peaceful. It was uh, another bloody page of, um, of the war. And certainly the idea yeah. is to make uh, this uh, story and history more complex uh, with the participation of uh, different voices uh, uh, in closing. Of, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, one of the most shocking stories, this is a, not, not a very happy note to end on, is, is um, uh, the, I came across the, in the memoir of a guy who, who went in, he was a, a nurse. And uh, as he, he nurses up uh, an American soldier who'd gone into Sicily, and he described to him how he had raped an Italian woman. And, and so, yeah, no, the Americans were not all this is yeah, one it wasn't of, always a joyful encounter of giving away chocolates. This is one chocolates. of the stories that, that has surfaced uh, and that my project hasn't been able to um, embrace it at the moment, uh, given that the theme is that is that of food. Uh, but again, uh, uh, the goal is not that of producing a happy picture. Although I have to say people we interviewed always wanted to end with that good note. And I yeah. am convinced, uh, perhaps because of my my specific interest uh, as, a, as a scholar, that it has a lot to do with the myth of America uh, that in a way overpowers uh, actual experiences uh, or cultural readings of history and ends up in representing uh, this country as the one that protects uh, the one that, that gives. And so this is the prevalent memory, I have to say, uh, at least uh, so far. Somebody asked what we're gonna do with these interviews. For the moment, uh, uh, they're being posted and uh, we will send you an email with the link so you can uh, appreciate more of them. This was just a selection. Mm -hmm. And hopefully in the long term, we can organize everything into a, uh, um, a, docu a, a documentary. And uh, uh, we, um, we don't mean to, uh, to, to slam Americans, of course, uh, in, uh, in closing. Uh, as, I, as I said, uh, it's a complex history. It's a history made up of happy moments, uh, of encounters, uh, of misunderstandings, uh, but it's obviously uh, a conflict, right, uh, with uh, conflicting yeah. positions. Um, and uh, uh, since uh, we're done now, Lydia, with uh, uh, the q and I want to uh, leave you with uh, uh, um, a thank you uh, to all of you who participated. Uh, Lizzie Collingham for your wonderful lecture. Thank you, Maurizio Cellur and Jeff Strickland uh, for their contextualization of, uh, of the topic. Ken, for your uh, uh, perspective as a student and video maker. And I want to remind you that this was just a taste to, to stay within the met metaphor. Just solo un assaggio. There are many more scholars, uh, uh, local as well. Somebody mentioned Calogero Carita, for example, uh, Il Dottor Allotta in Agrigento, uh, that we want to include in the future, as well as uh, on the US side. And of course, uh, more voices coming from the interviews. Let me tell you about the next event, which I hope you will be able to uh, attend. It's linked to Sicily again. Uh, uh, it's a, a bit of a coincidence that they're back to back, although I do pay attention to uh, Sicily for the obvious reason that I am from, from there. And it's a very, very uh, rich place culturally. We're gonna talk about other transnational routes, uh, Aztec chocolate in Sicily brought during uh, the uh, Spanish uh, uh, imperial dominion of uh, Sicily and other parts uh, of Italy. Uh, we're gonna do it as part of an online cooking lesson uh, with uh, the chef uh, Annalisa Pompeo. And uh, if you go to uh, the link moncler.edu slash insera dash chair, uh, you can uh, find uh, the link to the uh, upcoming event or the general calendar uh, to register. Uh, thank you again for remaining with us. It's still a very large group, even though we went uh, over time, a sign that this was uh, a topic of interest that we hope we can uh, continue to address uh, uh, from different perspectives. So thank you to uh, all of you, including the audience. Grazie, arrivederci, alla prossima. Thank you, till the next one. <laughs>